Okay, I think it can begin. Um, hope everyone's adjusting to this new way of teaching in life. Um, I must admit I'm still adapting. Um, I also find it a little a little odd to be sitting the entire lecture. I get I miss being able to stand up and move around a little bit. But I'm sure we all adapt to things and things will improve as we go along. Are there any questions before we begin? Okay, Let's see the classes slightly more active than they were in class because now you can give chats and you can do this. Um, recall where I sort of left off last time. Um, we're talking about networking. And with the goal of being able to write a Android app that you know can talk to a server, either to send data to the server or um, you know, get data from the server. And we're then looking at how to actually form up the data, what sort of um, that extension to use. And we start ended last time talking about JSON. Mm. Put my slides up. Mm. There we go. So I'll back up a little bit to remind them about JSON. Um, You know, JSON is this general um, location to change data. It, as the name indicates, it comes from JavaScript. Um, there is a long line of data formats that people use to try and do this. And I'm sure we'll find more and more as we go along. Um, you know, sometimes they are too complicated. Sometimes they are too simple. Um, here we have um, JSON allows us to map the following data types, null, true, false, any sort of number, strings, 
and rays and objects of those things. Um, like I said last time, yeah, but you, you know, in this case, I'm using an example of Java, but it could, you know, yeah. When we use Kotlin, eventually we are using Java. So it's, you know, we convert the Kotlin data into a JSON object, convert it to a string, and then we can write it to a file, or we can send it to a server and get it back from the server. Um, and examples of the data, um, you know, numbers, various formats, integers, slopes, scientific notation, um, null, true and false, so pretty straightforward. And then a string, again, is, is very C-like, Java-like, and they also use the, right, backslash to indicate a special character inside of a string, and you have the usual suspects of new line tab, um, embedding the backslash, etc. cetera. Um, and here we have an example of arrays and arrays are and again, here's an array of just integers, but they can hold any data type. Um, you know, a string, a number, a true, and slightly more complicated, you know, decimal point number, another array, and an integer. Objects. Um, you know, simple called dictionaries, you know, it's key value pairs. Keys are always strings. Um, the values can be any legal JSON data type. Um, so like I said last time, here's key for name, string for value, age, and then value of the number. A slightly more complicated example, um, we have the multiple keys separated by commas, ID, office, right, phone number, email, and then a rating. The key there has right, the values and is a dictionary. Um, again, the, the values can be any valid JSON object. Um, for a long time, you know, validation documents had one top level item and could be anything. Um, since then, that has changed. You can have multiple objects at top level, but still in usage, I think this is a pretty common thing to do. Um, just have this one top level item. Uh, normally, that's going to be a an array or a dictionary, so you can have multiple values. And, you know, then we need to be able to convert between um, a language data type into a JSON object. And so there's a standard JSON library. Um, JSON object, which deals with object at the top level, and JSON array, which is JSON array at the top level. And these are included in Android for us. Um, here's an example of using it for using JSON objects. Um, so here I'm creating a JSON object and I'm adding um, different key value pairs into the object. And then when I want to get the string value out, um, it's just to a string on the JSON object. And in the comment here, I pointed out what string we get. And again, it's just 
curly brackets indicate that it's an object in JSON. Then the keys are all strings um, and the various values. And then what I do here is show you how to take that string and convert it back to a JSON object. Um, right, so it's just JSON object and in the constructor you pass in that string. And now we need to be able to get the values out. Um, and then it's the standard get method. So um, get int, get array, get object, which means we have to know um, at each key what type of data is associated with that key. And that'll come up later um, when we finally get to the assignment where you have to know, we have to know in advance when we talk to the server and it's going to send us a JSON object, or we have to know is it a are we going to get an object? Are we going to get an array? Is an object? What are the keys? And at each key, what value is actually coming back? That way, we'll know to call it get in to get out. Get number. Um, and yeah, you know, the JSON object has you know two basic methods. One, the simplest one is put, where it's just a key and the value, um, then get, where x um, can be any one of you know, boolean, double, int, array, object, long, and string. And of course, for the put value, we need to know what type it can be, and here are the options. Here's an example of JSON array. Again, I create an empty JSON array object. Now I just use put right, to add things. Um, and again, to actually convert this to a string, right, we just use two string. And once I've got a JSON object, again, we use the standard, the same get methods to get things out, but this time the argument is not the key, but the actual location. And there's a number of third party libraries which will, we can use to do the same thing. Um, I don't cover them because in our use case, we're going to use Volley, and Volley will do this, help us do this anyway. So, um, any questions so far? No. Okay, right. So, and that's JSON, and now we want to. Go on. Um, and look at how we can use this. Um, and now we need to talk about how we are actually going to have our application connect to a server and send information back and forth. Um, there's various ways we can do this. You now we can open up a regular socket um, and then to the server that is possible but it's not recommended um, there's each of the url connection um, which is one that one way built into android to make to make these connections um, there was an http client to make things a little simpler has been deprecated. There are a number of, again, third, well, third party libraries. Um, in this case, we'll look at one called Volley. Um, it's really not a third party because Google is the one that created it, um, but it's not included as part of Android, which is a little strange because it's very popular. 
So I'm not sure why they just didn't include it. Um, if we are going to be doing networking, the request information, um, there's two things we need we need to do inside um, the manifest file. Um, one is we need permission, ask permission to use the internet. Um, and this is again done for several reasons. One is it tells Android what services we will be using. Um, so when people uh, download your application from the App Store, they can see the list of all the things that um, all the services that your application is going to use. Um, if we forget to do this, um, and we then try and open the network connection to a server, you'll get an error. And again, this is for security. Um, Android's had a lot of problems with this. Um, initially, one could do things like read files or access a network. Um, without asking for permission. Um, and so some applications are doing that, send information back to their servers that users were not aware of, and if they were aware of, would not have wanted it. Now, next thing is, again, ask for permission as networks access the network state. Um, the other problem is, you know, if you're using the application and you're you know flying someplace in an airplane, you're at three thousand feet, and you don't want to pay the five or ten dollars right to use the Wi-Fi network, you don't have a network connection, um, and so your application really should check to see. Does the device have a network connection? If it doesn't have a network connection, there's no no reason to actually you know, try and make a network connection, have it fail, have to give all the failures. Right. So we really like to be able to check to see whether does the device currently have a network connection, um, and that's what this second use is permission is for. So how do we actually ask for permission? Um, there's actually two ways. One is um, everything prior to Android 10. And in Android 10, they've changed the way it works. Um, the old way is right here. So I've got a function that is online, which returns true if it's connected. Mm -hmm. And basically, we, we get the connectivity manager, um, get the active network information, and then ask if it's connected or not. Um, now, the reason they've, they've changed it in Android 10 is they said, look, there's Android devices have multiple ways of actually being on the network. Um, and so what they really want you to do is check, okay, you got a Wi-Fi network, you, are you on the cell network, um, are you on some other network? The problem is hardly any devices now run Android 10. And so if you just target Android 10, um, you got a pretty small audience. So at this point, this is what we have to do. And when you do it, um, Android Studio say, oh, by the way, do you realize these things are deprecated? So the choices are either we use deprecated methods or we only target Android 10. 
and I don't recommend the latter. Okay, HTTP URL connection. Um, Well, we, op we open a connection, um, we, repair, we get our URL, create our URL, um, we may add information to the, the body of request, and then wait for the response. So I'm going to be using an example um, for one of my past assignments, and um, so the assignment was basically build an application where students could indicate their hometown. Um, and so one of the issues was wanting to list all the countries in which people could be in. And so there was a URL. In this case, I'm using a, a local server on my machine, so I didn't have to worry about my machine in the office running the application um, that would return a JSON object which contains a list of countries. Um, and that's going to be important for when we come to this assignment. Since we're using HTTP as a way of sending data back and forth, it means that most of the time you can check the um, server by using a web browser. That's what I've done here is gone into a web browser, and I typed in the URL, and I get the response. And again, we can see it's JSON and um, the Square brackets tells us that it's a JSON array. Um, and we didn't have to write any code, right? See the answer. And this is, well, I can't tell you how important this is in the sense of you've all had the experience of something going wrong on your application and spending hours trying to figure out what's wrong. When we're dealing with network programming, it gets worse um, in the sense of, okay, I'm going to send a request off the server and something goes wrong. Well, the question is, is, is my code wrong on making the request? Um, is the network down? Is the server down? Is there an error on the server? Um, is there an error on my code reading the data coming back? And so there's all these different spots, right, where things could go wrong, and all you know is something went wrong. And I can't tell you the number of times that a student has contacted me on an assignment and said, it doesn't work. And I'm like, well, there's about 10 million things that go wrong, and you, if you don't tell me anything more than it doesn't work, I'm stuck. The same thing here, there's a number of things that go wrong, and if we don't have ways of eliminating some of the problems, um, it's gonna be much, much harder. But this way, um, I go to the web browser, here's a request, oh, the server's up, the network's up, so it's not those issues, right? I'm doing something wrong in my code. So here is basically doing the same thing in code. Um, so I'm declaring this to be a URL connection. So to do that, um, I need the URL. And then I can ask the URL to open the connection but now the problem is there are different types of connections that can be opened up. Um, so that's why I'm converting it as a uh, URL connection. Um,
And now I do two things. Um, I'm not sure how those back ticks got in there. They shouldn't be there. Um, I'm doing two things. One is I'm asking how long is the data we got, how, how many bytes are there in the data coming back? I do that here. And then I need to get an input stream to actually read the data. And I'm doing the actual reading um, in a function on the next slide. And unfortunately, um, there are several things that can go wrong. Um, one is I just had my URL wrong. I typed it wrong, in wrong, um, and that will throw an exception. The other is there was some I.O. problem. Um, and then what I do is I want to close that connection um, and I leave this without either exceptions in raised, so I can't get the results, or I have results, so I don't need the connection anymore. And it's, you do want to be careful with closure connections. So here's my read it function. Um, I'm getting input stream and I'm getting a length. Um, and then I want to create a input stream reader because readers are a bit easier to um, deal with. Um, and then I need a buffer and then I read into the buffer and then I um, convert that buffer into string. Now I have to tell you that this code isn't exactly correct um, because I really should check to see how much how many bytes are read from the reader. Um, because it may not have read all the bytes, maybe it's gonna do it again. Um, but I I didn't go to the work to make it correct because this is way too much work. You don't want to do this, right? Um, this is part of the verbosity of Java that people have chafed against for decades. Um, and so we're not going to do it. You don't want to do it this way. Um, it's just too, too painful. Um, And yes, there are some issues we have to deal with. Um, remember, we don't want to run long running functions on the UI thread um, because they block. And anytime you go with the network, it is going to take, a, take longer than you want. So you do not want to be doing any um, network calls on the UI thread. And if you do that, um, Android should uh, throw, an, throw an error for you. Um, also notice we needed the length of response. Um, we have to handle those errors. And if we're getting JSON back, we need to parse it. So the, right, we talked last time about async task and async task is a way of starting something on the main thread, UI thread, and then doing something in the background. And then when it's in the background, when it's done, it will, link, it will return the answer to the main thread so we can do something with it on the main thread. Display, update something on the screen. Um, So here's an example of um, 
using async tasks to do this. Uh, <clears throat> I'll let you know in advance that, again, this is more complicated than you really want it. Um, so you don't have to panic about understanding this because it's not how you want to do it. But it should make you feel much better about what we need to do when we get to it. Um, so again, we need to do subclass async task. And remember, we need to give it uh, three generics. Um, one is the type that's going into doing background. Right? The next one is what sort of data are we going to send back to give periodic updates? In this case, we're not to give any updates. And then we need to specify the actual data we're going to send back to the main thread when we're done. Um, And now, when I'm done, on post execute is called, here's my result, and all I'm doing is logging it to, to show that it works. Since I'm not in the real application, so I don't want to connect up to a widget to show it on the screen. Um, the work, the background is done, and doing background, and again, um, I'm going to show you how to do the read in the next another slide. Um, and there are exceptions that can be raised or catch them. And again, even though I'm passing in a string, right, um, it treats it as a var arg, which means we get an array of string. And that's why I'm passing in the first element of the array because I'm only passing in one string, which is the URL. So, actually this is the same code we looked at before. Um, that is, you know, there's our connection, um, Get the URL, get the URL connection, the HTTP object, get the content length, right, of the response. Um, now, at this point, I need to point out um, there's a big gap in time between these two, right? Um, when I start here, that's when I'm going to open the connection to the server. I'm going to open the connection, server accepts the connection. Our code then sends the URL to it. And then the server does what it's going to do and returns response. And then, so this get content link blocks until the response is sent back to us. And, um, the connection basically closed. And then I get my input stream so I can read from it, and then I call my read it function again and return that value. So I'm basically doing the same thing because I do it in the background. Um, method in the URL connection. And then to actually call it, right, again, we you know, quick instantiate the download web page task, and then I call execute on it, and um, I give it the URL. Now here's where I need to start giving the warnings. And I need to do it multiple times. 
and somebody will still get caught on this. Um, so it's important you understand what's going on. Um, Let's say I had, I should have done this in the slide, but let's say I had some meth afterwards, I had some method, you know, rent. Done, right? Now what's gonna happen here is, this is an ASIC task. Um, so when I call execute, what we know is going to happen is, let me go back to the previous slide, um, we're going to um, call this to in background, it's going to call download URLs, and that's going to then you know, do its work, and there's going to be a pause there, it's going to wait until it gets the response back, and then it's going to get the answer and return it. Um, and then this is going to return it to on false execute, and I'm going to print it up. But this print statement will be executed immediately after we call execute, and long before, right, the answer is back from the server, long before. And here is what is going to happen. When you start doing the network, network application, you're going to make a call to the server, and then you're going to have a, a line right after your call to use the answer, and it won't be there. Right? And typically, what happens is right after that, you re, re, make the call, um, a student will then take what they think is a result and display it right in the text field. And it'll be empty. And like, huh, it didn't work. And then they hit the you know, do it again, do it button again, and then it works. And you go, why isn't it working the first time? And the answer is, oh, it did work the first time, but you grabbed the answer before the answer was back. And so the answer was nil, empty, and so that's what you got. And when you call do it again or the do it button to make the request again well the second request was still not completed but the first request had been completed and now your answer you're getting the answer from the first time um, you really have to keep in mind that when you make that call to the server that's going to be done in the background and you're going to have a callback method to do all the work you need to the answer Right. And some of you are going to spend hours and hours trying to figure out um, why it's not working on the first time, but it's working the second time. And so this is my first warning. I'll do it again um, several more times. Um, the goal is to save you some painful moments. If you're a web developer, you've seen this before. Um, servers will give you error messages depending what type of thing went wrong on the server. Um, get a response. Um, and the 200, that's like everything worked perfectly, you're good. Um, any, any response, that's on a 300 level is a client error. It means you did something wrong. Um, 500 is oh, something went wrong on the server. Um, now, if you're getting a response like this, that's a status header. That means the request made it to the server and you're getting a response back. That's just one type of thing that can go wrong, right? If you got the wrong URL, um, then there's no server at the other end, and so you're not going to get a response back because there's no one at the other end to answer. Um,
So here I modified my download URL function um, to check this response code. Um, so again, I get the contents length, um, which means response has come back from the server. Um, and now I can ask the response code and the response code is not 200, something went wrong. Um, so there's no need to try and read the, read the rest of the response. So something went wrong. Um, and now I can do this laborious thing where I can get an input stream and read the input stream. So far so good. I'm good over here. Good, good. Okay, so um, if you read the network um, you know, document to specify the HTTP protocol, um, the server is supposed to send return the content link back in the header of response. Um, the problem is that doesn't always happen. Um, and so one other option is, you know, just to read to the end of file. Um, but that's a little dangerous because um, when you're reading from a network request, the end of file is only sent when the connection is dropped. Now in HTTP 1.0, the server will drop the connection once it sends your response back. But in 1.1 and 1.2 protocols of HTTP, the server does not have to do that. And so, it, they may not put I minutes. Mean, they should close the connection unless you request it to stay open. But in general, reading to end a file on our connection can cause a problem. And the problem is you the connection is not dropped, you will you will not stop reading and you will block um, waiting for more data when there's no more data to come. And I haven't checked recently, um, but one of the examples of how to use your, your collection, um, they use this, server they use an example, it did not return the content link. Um, it is sort of strange because Google usually does things fairly well. Okay, um, that just got us to the point where we've got the response back and now as a string and we now need to convert that string into a JSON object so we can pull the values out. Um, now in the past I'd show you how to do that. We've seen how to do it by ourselves but not in the network connection but I don't do that now, um, but again, it's it's basically a boilerplate. I mean, um, you just take the code you did in the last time you did it, and you copy it over, and it's basically the same. Um, which again is one of the reasons why people are interested in Kotlin because Kotlin helps reduce some of the boilerplate. So rather than show you how to do various things like this, um, I want to get to um, Bali. Um, and this, it's a very popular library. And the reason is, it, there's all this boilerplate things you have to do, and Bali does that for you. Um, 
they get to operate at a slightly higher level. Um, and it's, like I said, it's, it was developed by Google, um, but you have to download it. And there is, you know, they have their documentation on how to use Dolly. You've got more information than I give you here. There are various ways to download Volley. The simplest way, and the, the way you need to do it, should do it, is add implementation, you know, com Android Volley, colon Volley, Volley, one, 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 um, to your build Gradle. And then when you, when you change your, your build Gradle file, it will then ask you want to sync up, and when you do that, it will download the library for you. Now you can actually download the library as source code and add it to the project. Um, it's better to do this way because um, what happens when they update the um, version number, um, basically Android's to go tell you, hey, by the way, there's a, there's a newer version, do you wanna download it? Um, and then you can be notified and get the latest or not, if you don't want to change. So the basic parts we need to know about, um, there's a request queue. Um, this is basically a queue for requests. And so you can make multiple requests at the same time, uh, you can make requests to the server. Um, it will process those requests off the UI thread, so you don't have to worry about creating async tasks or anything else. You can say, here's my request, and it will, it will transfer them from the main thread or the UI thread to the background thread for you. And it also keeps a thread pool back there. So if you're making multiple requests, you're not, um, you're not, you're not blocking, the first request is not blocking the second request. Um, we need to make a request, and the request has three parts. One is the URL. Um, you know, what do you, you know, where do you want to go? What server do you want to talk to? Um, and then we need a response listener, and this is when the response comes back, one or two things happen. It's either it was a successful request, in which case the listener will be called to um, process, process the result. If something went wrong, then the response error listener will be called. And so a request needs all three, where to go, what to do when we're successful, and what to do when something went wrong. And there, there are a number of different requests we can make. Um, you know, one is I'm getting a string back. Um, there's two for JSON objects, um, or JSON, there's one for JSON object and one from JSON array. So we, we need to know when we make the request, how we're getting back an object or an array. Um, and there's also uh, a request specifically for images. So if the server, if you request an image from the server, then um, you use that type of request. So the basic, again, the basic workflow is quite simple. First, you create a request queue. Usually, you do that once. Um, and then, we can create a request, edit the queue. Um, and then again, I'm going to warn you, right? The request has two listeners, right? Um, those listeners will be done for you um, at a later date. 
because they have to wait for the response to come back from the server. So your next line cannot use the result yet. And the listeners are called on the UI thread, right? So here is um, an example of using Volley. Um, like I said, I need we need to first get the request queue, um, and the request queue needs the current context. It needs a current context because it needs to be able to send your request to the background, which you can do without the without the context. But coming back, it needs to know which context to connect it to, um, execute properly on the, the main thread, the UI thread. Um, I we need the the URL. Um, so here I'm just going to get the um, main search page for Google. Um, here's my request. Like I said, there's three things. Um, here's my the URL for the request. Here is my my response my listener for when things go right. Um, and all I'm doing is printing out the response, and then. Um, here's my error listeners for when things go wrong. Um, and just to remind you that this it, um, you know, basically both the listeners um, have a single argument, and that single argument is a lambda. And so Colin allows us to, instead of using the brackets, we use the curly brackets. Um, for the lambda, and the first case, I'm actually here's the argument to that lambda function that is going to be uh, listeners going to give to us. There is no arg. You know, I'm ignoring the argument here, and so I get to use it, which refers to the argument being passed um, to my lambda from the error listener, and then finally. I have to add the request to my queue. And then I'm done. Right. So again, I'm going to point out that what's going to happen is I call get request, right? I do this, I do this, I do this, right? Um, I do this. My code is now done. And I execute this method, I execute this method, and now you know my main activity is waiting for the user to do something. But at a certain point in the future, after the server is bonded, then right this listener will be executed on the main thread. In this case, I will then see that log response coming. And here's all the headers. Um, Android Studio is getting better at prompting you for um, what's important to use, but sometimes I find it somewhat frustrating when you come across an example in, in a texture on a network. And it's like, okay, what classes are you really using? Um, so here they are. And again, this is right, this is the entire volley part. Um, 
and you have to admit that it's a lot simpler and shorter than using the async task. And they should be connection object, right? And basically doing the whole thing um, in one, two, three, four, five, six lines. That's pretty sweet. I like that. Yeah, no, that's just, I mean, um, if you're going to be doing network programming in Android, um, you want to use Volley. There are some cases where it gets slightly more complicated, um, but they're still simpler than the alternatives. And again, it's for me, um, you know, I used to teach a course on network programming. And yeah, it's sort of nice to get down to the low level details and understand sockets and how they work and what's going on and buffering and on and on and on. But most of the time, and for most of us, what we're doing, our goal is to build an application, right? That we can we give out to the public to use. I mean, to sell it or, um, but the application is what the goal is, not the low level network details. And getting the application to do what we want it to do is complicated enough. And so we really want libraries which allows us to focus in on our hard part and not their hard part. Um, so this, yeah, this is very sweet because it's like, it's, it's very straightforward, um, you know, quite simple. And we're in, we're in the background, well, well, it does that for us, right? We don't have to do, we don't have to worry about it. It's handled for us, they take care of it, um, and they do a, you know, since it's with Google engineers, they're gonna do a much better job optimizing things than we could. Um, That's debatable. What's that? That's debatable. Mm, never <laughs> I mean, is, can't be complicated. Yeah, I was just kidding about the gold Google employees. Yeah. Um, worrying about the response codes, you don't have to worry about that because Volley does it, right? Um, content link, you know, Volley is taking care of that for us. Um, parsing the JSON, we will see that Volley does that for us too. Okay, again, I'm, I'm going to repeat this over and over again, multiple times. You'll probably get sick and tired of me saying this. Um, but again, I, I want to point out the order of operations where things are being done, right? So look, I start here, I, I create my request queue, right? Um, here's my URL. So now I'm going to print out a log statement saying, okay, I started. Um, and then, you know, basically both my listeners are just going to print out, you know, I got a response or I got an error. And then, you know, I print out, I'm going to add to the queue. I add to the queue and then I print out that we're after adding to the queue. Okay. Um, and now the output is, well, first I get start, that makes sense, right? Because that's the very first thing. Um, and okay, nothing's going to happen until I add the request to the queue. So this makes sense because I haven't added the request to the queue yet, so the queue can't process the request. 
now I get at, after add to the queue. Again, because response hasn't come back from the server yet. And then afterwards I get get response. All right. Is that clear everyone that this get response is coming afterwards? Um, because, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, this because we we have to wait for the server to respond before we can actually call that code. And let me see if I can do this. I get with all these marks. Um, and here's where people, here's the mistake people are going to be making. Let's say I have someplace up here, I've got a var, and I'll just call it foo, right? And I won't worry about the type and assigning it. And then what I'll do here is instead of doing log, I will say foo equals response. And that's, um, let's say foo equals none, right? And then after I add the queue, right, what people are gonna be doing, they'll say, okay, now I want to, I have some sort of text field to say output. And then the text equals foo, All right? And then they're gonna run this code and then what's going to display on the screen, What what is output? the text field output going to show, it's going to show none, right? Because this full with the response in our listener has not been executed yet. Hopefully that's clear. Um, It's a natural mistake because if you haven't been programming with threads or concurrency or network programming, everything you've ever done in code is like you start from the top and you go down, you execute in that way. And so by the time you get to the last statement, everything above has been executed. But that's not the case here. So again, right, all the networking and parsing is down in the background and response listener is run on the UI thread. Um, so here's my example using a JSON request. Um, so again, you know, it's the same example as using before. Um, where I'm getting, I'm going to, my server is going to return a JSON array of objects. So again, starting the queue is the same. URL is just the URL. What's different is now, instead of a string request, I request a JSON. I want a JSON array request because I know the server is going to return a JSON array from that URL. Um, and then I just have a call a function with it again, and it's going to be the response. And then I got my air listener. Um, when I add this to the queue, right? Sometime later, right, process response is going to be 
um, called and probably automatically it's going to take the response sent to my server and convert it to a JSON array and give me the JSON array object. Um, and since it's an array, right, I can then say, well, how long is it? Um, how long it is? And then I can have a for statement to go through the list and, and the nice thing about Colin is it allows to convert those get values into indexing. Um, and then I can convert, convert it to where that type of thing be. So again, right, Bali is handling, handling networking part of it, it's handling going back in the background, back the background thread, back in on the main UI thread, and it's handling parsing that JSON string that the server sent into a JSON object, in this case a JSON array, because I told it was a JSON array. Um, all those low level details are handled for us so we can focus on, on, well, go to that location and give me the JSON array so I can get the data out and do something with it. Now we can ask, you know, what happens? Um, if I ask for a JSON array request and the server actually sends back a JSON object, well, the answer is it's going to try and parse that JSON object as a, an array and it can't until we give an error. And so then we'll get our error that's no problem. Again, literally, you know, in one slide, I've handled basically the entire, entire thing. So, it's far shorter, um, hot, far, hot, more higher level than the you know, URL network connection. Yeah, we have these methods. Um, there are a lot of things we can do with Folly. Um, you know, what happens if you, know, you make the request and take a long time, we can cancel the request. Um, they have caching, so we can cache, we can cache answers responses so that if you make, you make the same request again, we can read it from the thread in the cache. Um, we can configure the request queue. Whenever you're doing networking, you love networking parameters, you can, you can set, optimize. So, um, so if we know enough and we're happy with you know, the settings that Google said in the volley, we can change that. Um, creating a request queue is expensive. Um, you only want one active at a time. Um, so if we're doing a lot of networking in lots of places, um, you may want to create the queue once and then just share it with between activities. And let's see. To cancel the request is just call cancel on the request object and that will do it for us. Um, here's my example. Um, 
I have to warn you of this example. Uh, sneak number one. Um, I get start. If I go back and cancel, right? Go back and forth. Um, the second time I did it, it happened too fast, so I couldn't, right? Um, and then once I got the response back, it's feeding from cash, we, can, we can't go fast enough to cancel it. This example no longer runs um, because campus no longer allows HTTP requests. They all have to be HTTPS requests. So, um, and there was some problem with the S, and I haven't figured that out yet. Um, well, all again, I'm doing is, you know, here's my on create, and it's, you know, st standard stuff. And then I have the two buttons, and I set on click listener. Um, and you know, the, the start just calls get request and cancel just calls cancel on this um, web page during request objects. Um, and get request as we've seen before. Um, I'm setting output text to be empty just to show that um, I can start refresh each time then my queue, my URL, and then my listeners, right? Add to my queue and I'm done. And when response comes back, if I would cancel it yet, then I'm setting that text um, and I'll put to it. So literally, in one slide, I was able to create a very simple application with two buttons that made admittedly extremely simple requests in the network. But still it worked, right? One page. And mind you, I'm doing it 24 font size and it has to be on these crazy slides, which are not they're short. The height is short and the width is longer. And I think we're basically out of time. Um, last material. Are there any questions before we? Can I ask something? Yeah. When does the REW stand for? You spun of some of the variables like REW web page. Oh, um, those are my initials. Oh, I was like, what is that something magic he's referring to? No, no, just my initials, right? So this is my um, URL for my campus webpage. Okay. Any other questions? Professor, uh I have one question regarding assignment two, okay. assignment three, sorry. Uh, so the assignment says that uh, in the animation mode, lines will move based on the pool of gravity. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, do we have to use accelerator, accelerometer here or uh, do we have to use the cursor position? And depending on the cursor position, we have to uh, draw the animation for okay. the shapes. Um, for gravity, it's acceleration, accelerometer. Okay, so it's not like when I place the cursor on the shape and then shape will be moved as per the cursor position. It's not like that. No, no, if we're looking um, for gravity, you use accel accelerometer. Okay, okay, fine. And I, I'll talk about that next week. So when we have accelerometer, um, okay. Even if you if you put the your your phone on on a table, right? Accelerometer mm -hmm. will sh still show that there's you're accelerating downward because your gravity is pulling on it, and so, so you will get um, a value there. 
even though the phone's not moving at all. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Is it good to rely a lot in third party libraries? Like, I know Volley is from Google and Google and Android go pretty well, but it's kind of scary just to depend on the third party library, especially for this network stuff. Um, yeah, you know, um, so before I use a library, usually they've got a GitHub repository and I go there and I look at how many stars um, they have, how many commits they've had, um, one of the last time they updated the, the project is I'll use it. Um, you know, Vol is pretty safe because it, it came from the same people that did, that did Android. Okay. Sounds good to me. So, um, before we take a break for the weekend, how are you finding doing this completely remotely? I think it's fine. I, we can see the the PowerPoint. We can hear you lecture. It's it's just the same, and we can collaborate. So. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's okay. Yeah. So yeah, even I think uh, it's working fine for me as of now because. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I can like follow it, uh, everything that's happening and with the markings on the screen, it, it makes it much easier to follow right now. Okay. I mean, comparing, comparing this Zoom, right? It is better than the previous app looks like because it is interactive. Uh, we can communicate even in the online lectures, we can ask questions. That's true. I agree on that part too. Yeah. Yeah, I have to admit that whenever I get to go back to in class situation, I need I'm trying to figure out how to do a similar thing. Um, I think you know being able to mark on the slides like this is good. Um, the problem of having students ask questions in class. And online is complicated, but I so I have to work on that. It's hard to keep track of who is where, but um, ever since you've been doing these Zoom classes, I, I haven't seen the previous lecture. Uh -huh. So do do these markings show up in the recordings? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and I, um, I have modify the lecture video page so there's now a um, listing of the rest of the semester and a link to the videos and the videos are now posted on um, YouTube on my channel um, so you can also subscribe to that channel and get, get notified when I put new videos up but I also, both my classes go there, so you'll get notifications for both classes to do that. That's cool. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. Okay, I hope everyone has a good weekend. You too. You too. Yeah. You too. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.